To in review, Print Speaking to the Blind, celebrating 40 years of audio newspaper production. Welcome to this week's edition of the Herald Scotland podcast, recorded at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre by our amazing volunteers. You can get in touch with us via Facebook, Twitter or Instagram using at TuneReview, that is at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. You can also contact us directly by emailing information at tunereview.com, that is I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M or by calling 0141-772-3976 That's 0141-772-3976 This is from the Herald, Scotland on Thursday the 19th of October 2023 from the news section Flynn urges Sunak to set up Gaza refugee scheme and back ceasefire This article is written by David Ball. The SNP Westminster leader has called on the Prime Minister to set up a refugee settlement scheme for Palestinian refugees fleeing the conflict in Gaza. Stephen Flynn also appealed for Rishi Sunak to back an immediate ceasefire in the Middle East. The plea comes as Hamza Yousaf's mother-in-law said she can't take another night in Gaza according to an SNP MP. Elizabeth El Nakla has been stuck in Gaza with her husband, Maged, since the escalation in hostilities last weekend. According to SNP MP Chris Law, speaking during Prime Minister's questions, Ms El Nakla made her final goodbyes in a call with the First Minister and her daughter, Nadia, this morning. The Dundee West MP said, Members of her family were hit yesterday by a rocket from a drone, and Nadia's mother was saying her final goodbyes this morning, adding, Last night was the end for me. Better if my heart stops and then I will be at peace. I can't take another night. Mr Flynn spoke at Prime Minister's questions, as Mr Sunak also came under pressure for information on a reported attack on a hospital in Gaza yesterday. The SNP Westminster leader asked the PM, will he join with us on these benches and call for an immediate ceasefire in the region? Mr Flynn later added, my ask for a ceasefire was done with all sincerity, sincerity to protect civilians, but also to ensure that we have the safe creation of humanitarian corridors Humanitarian corridors which will allow for food, for water and for vital medicines to get into Gaza, but also for innocent civilians caught up in this terrible conflict to flee. In respect of those who wish to flee, can I ask the Prime Minister what early consideration, if any, his government has given to the creation of a refugee resettlement scheme akin to that previously put in place for Syrian nationals, Afghani nationals and, of course, Ukrainian nationals. Mr Sunak did not address calls for a resettlement scheme, but did say the UK was one of the most significant contributors to the United Nations' efforts to support Palestinian refugees. The Prime Minister added, With regard to humanitarian aid, as I said before, we are already working through preemptively moving aid and relief teams into the region. But critically, the most important thing is to open up access for that aid to get into Gaza, which is why our conversations with the Egyptians and others are so critical. First Minister Hamza Yousaf made a similar appeal for a resettlement scheme at SNP conference yesterday, claiming that Scotland would be the first to offer safety and sanctuary to those caught up in these terrible attacks. The Prime Minister told MPs that the UK is working to find out what happened at Gaza's al Ahly hospital yesterday. Mr Sunak told the House of Commons, I know the whole House will have been shocked by the scenes at al Ahly hospital. As the Foreign Secretary has said, we are working independently and with our allies to find out what has happened. 
Mr Sunak said that the UK's intelligence services had been rapidly analysing the evidence to find out what happened at the Al Ali hospital, but warned we should not rush to judgment. Both the Palestinian and Israeli authorities have blamed each other for the attack, amid claims several hundred civilians were killed. Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer said the reports were incredibly distressing. He said, The Palestinians' fear that there's no place of safety is profound. International law must be upheld, and that means hospitals and civilian lives must be protected. Last night, the Foreign Secretary said the UK will work with our allies to find out what has happened. I know this only happened last night, but can the Prime Minister please tell us when he thinks he might be able to update the House on progress with that? In response, Mr Sunak said, Any loss of innocent life is a dreadful tragedy. He added, We should not rush to judgment before we have all the facts on this awful situation. Every member will know that the words we say here have an impact beyond this House. This morning I met with the National Security Advisor but also the chair of the Joint Intelligence Committee. I can tell him our intelligence services have been rapidly analysing the evidence to independently establish the facts. Sir Keir told MPs he has spoken with charities working in Gaza and heard their accounts of the harrowing humanitarian crisis. He added, The lights are going out and the innocent civilians of Gaza are terrified that they will die in the darkness, out of sight. International law must always be followed. Hamas are not the Palestinian people and the Palestinian people are not Hamas. Does he agree that medicines, food, fuel and water must get into Gaza immediately? This is an urgent situation and innocent Palestinians need to know that the world is not just simply watching, but acting to prevent a humanitarian catastrophe. Mr Sunak said an acute humanitarian crisis is unfolding, to which we must respond. He added, It's right we support the Palestinian people, because they are victims of Hamas too. Mr Law also asked Mr Sunak about ensuring the Rafah border can open to allow refugees to flee, highlighting the case of the First Minister's family. In response, the Prime Minister said, We are doing everything in our power to ensure the safety of British nationals that are caught up in all of this, including my calls with leaders across the region, particularly around opening the Rafah border crossing. He added, We continue to have dialogue both with the Israelis and the Egyptians about the Rafah crossing. That article was written by David Ball. This is from the Herald, Scotland, on Thursday the 19th of October 2023. From the news section. John Curtis. Here's how Humza Yusuf can secure NDREF2. This article is written by Andrew Learmonth. I can announce that the Scottish Government is proposing that the independence referendum be held on the 19th of October, 2023. So said Nicola Sturgeon on the 28th of June, 2022. That was the plan had the Supreme Court ruled that Holyrood had the power to legislation for a referendum on independence. Reader, as you'll know, it did not. While the SNP would probably rather Thursday, today, pass without occasion, Some in the independence movement plan on marking the day, if only to point out how far we are from a second vote. Alex Salmon, for example, will visit Ritchie Hall in Strickham, where he would have cast his ballot had Sturgeon's new vote taken place. It's nearly a decade since the first referendum, and there's no sign that a second is round the corner. At their conference over the weekend, the SNP killed off Nicola Sturgeon's Plan B to use the next general election as a de facto referendum. The position adopted by delegates was that they will seek to give democratic effect to Scotland becoming an independent country 
if they win a majority of seats when the UK next goes to the polls, widely expected to be next year. Though Rishi Sunak can, if he wants, hold on until January 2025. That means that if they win 29 of Scotland's 57 seats, they will attempt to start independence negotiations, or, if number 10 aren't up for that, then they will attempt to hold talks on holding a second referendum. But I don't think any of the SNP members who made the trip to the Space Age haunted shopping centre, that is Aberdeen's exhibition centre, believe for a second that those talks will take place. I mean, one of the reasons why the Unionists don't want to hold a referendum, Professor Sir John Curtis tells Unspun, is because of their risk of losing. There are, he thinks, two circumstances in which there might be another vote on the Constitution. Firstly, if there's a hung Parliament, and the SNP has sufficient leverage over the Labour Party. If we were talking prior to the Liz Truss fiscal event, one would say that there is a non-trivial probability of that happening, he adds. Two things have gone wrong for the SNP. The first is the Labour Party have gone way ahead in the polls, such that, frankly, what happens in Scotland is still potentially irrelevant. But then, of course, the second thing that's gone wrong is not only has the Labour Party gone up initially in tandem with what's going on south of the border, but also, more recently, the SNP vote has gone down. The SNP might find they lose 20 seats. So, obviously, the chances of a parliament in which they have leverage are even more diminished. The other, and this chimes with Humza Yousaf's speech to conference, is if the SNP and the wider Yes movement can get those opposed to independence involved in the debate. There's no guarantee of this, Professor Curtis cautions. They've got to come up with a good argument. But if they can start moving the dial so that support for independence gets to 55%, he argues, at some point the unionists will have to think, hang on, if we don't go on to the field of play, we're just allowing them to score goals. So the first thing they therefore have to do is to force the unionists into the debate. And once the unionists are forced into the debate, then it becomes more difficult for them to say, you ain't having a referendum because you're then beginning in public to accept that there is an argument going on that you feel it necessary to respond to. Earlier this week, Yousaf told the SNP conference that he hoped the independence debate would end the arguments over process and allow the party to concentrate not on the how, but on the why. But the problem here for the First Minister, according to Professor Curtis, is that his party has not got the intellectual case altogether. There has, he adds, been no real debate on Brexit. The international question in Scotland now faces is not the same as in 2014. There is a material change to circumstance, and the material changes to circumstances change the question. The question now is, do you want to be inside the UK but outside the EU? Or do you want to be inside the EU and outside the UK? That creates all sorts of interesting trade-offs. Basically, if Yousef wants to start talking about the how, he and his party are going to need to properly dedicate themselves to the debate and be honest with voters about what, for example, those trade-offs might mean. That article was written by Andrew Learmonth. This is from the Herald, Scotland, on Thursday the 19th of October, 2023, from the news section. Man who abducted and abused girl for 27 hours, jailed for 20 years. This article is written by Craig Williams. A paedophile who abducted a young girl as she walked home and sexually abused her for 27 hours has been jailed for 20 years. Andrew Miller, 53, who also uses the name Amy George, was dressed as a woman when he offered the primary school-aged child, whom he'd never seen before, a lift in February in the Scottish borders. 
Miller took the girl back to his house and subjected her to repeated attacks, which a judge described as every parent's worst nightmare. At the High Court in Edinburgh in May, Miller pleaded guilty to charges of abduction, sexual assault, watching pornography in the presence of the child under the age of 13, and possessing 242 indecent images of children. Sentencing Miller, Judge Lord Arthurson said, The narrative was frankly nauseating in terms of its depravity and criminal sexual deviancy. On your arrest, you denied the abduction and preposterously said you had acted in a motherly way. Abduction of young children for the purposes of sexual torment is a mercifully rare crime in this jurisdiction. Lord Arthurson told Miller his primary focus throughout was himself, and while he showed an understanding of the impact his crimes had on the wider public, it was limited in terms of the victim. During interviews with a risk assessor, Miller even attempted to place responsibility on his victim, the judge said. Lord Arthurson added, You told the assessor you went into business mode, trying to think of a plan. When he was interviewed by police after his arrest, Miller alluded to the victim being sexually active, the judge said. Lord Arthurson described Miller's crimes as brazen and chilling and uniquely appalling. The court was told Miller is transitioning into a woman. Miller has been held in male prison estate following a row over the jailing of transgender rapist Isla Bryson, who was sent to a female prison in February. Earlier, the judge described Miller's offences as abhorrent crimes of the utmost deviance and depravity, which were the realisation of every parent's worst nightmare. The child was locked in Miller's home for 27 hours, during which time she was repeatedly touched and also forced to watch pornography. She dialed 999 while Miller, who was wearing women's underwear, was asleep. The girl found the landline phone and called police, saying she had been touched inappropriately, the court heard. Miller, who had run a butcher's shop, claimed he offered the girl a lift because she was freezing and claimed forcing her to sleep in the bed with him was a motherly thing. After his arrest, three laptops were seized from his property and a total of 242 indecent images of children were found. Miller was sentenced to a 28-year extended sentence with 20 years to be spent behind bars and a further eight spent on licence under supervision in the community. He was also placed on the sex offenders register. After being sentenced, he was led down from the dock with his head bowed. Defending Miller, Victoria Dow told the court he had gone through significant periods of his life without harming anyone. She said he managed to keep his impulses under control by holding down a job and managing a successful business, but he had problems with low self-esteem. His issues were triggered by the closure of his businesses, leading to increasing alcohol consumption and pornography usage. Ms Dow said, Miller recognises and feels the horror of his conduct. He feels a deep sense of shame, but not only for himself, but those in his life who will feel the impact. Detective Chief Inspector Brian Burns said, Our thoughts today are with the victim and her family, who have shown incredible courage and strength throughout this ordeal. This was a significant investigation, and I would like to thank all those involved for their professionalism and commitment during what was an extremely challenging inquiry. Andrew Miller has pled guilty to serious offending and will now face the consequences of his actions. That article was written by Craig Williams. This is from the Herald, Scotland, on Thursday the 19th of October 2023, from the news section. Red weather warning Scotland. Danger to life from rainfall. This article is written by Ginny Sanderson. Scots have been warned to brace for danger to life 
from exceptional rainfall and high winds as Storm Babette strikes today. A rare red weather alert is in place for Aberdeenshire with warnings of danger to life from severe flooding and disruption from 6pm on Thursday evening, October the 19th. While the Met Office has put out amber alerts for wind and rain, covering Perth, Fife, Dundee, Aberdeen and a large stretch of Scotland north of Inverness. There is also a yellow weather warning for rain in place from 6am today for a huge area covering Glasgow, Dumfries, Ayr, Stirling, all the way up to Aberdeen but just missing Edinburgh. While another yellow warning for wind covers a large stretch of Scotland from Perth to the Shetland Isles. Red weather warning for rain in Scotland. The Met Office has announced a red weather warning for rain covering Aberdeenshire from 6pm on Thursday the 19th to 12pm on Friday October the 20th. People have been told to brace for exceptional rainfall which is expected to cause severe flooding and disruption. The areas covered by the warning include Montrose, Lawrence Kirk, Inverbervie, Kirimuir, Forfar and Brecon. The Met Office has warned of danger to life from fast flowing or deep flood water. It has also warned of extensive flooding to homes and businesses, collapsed or damaged buildings or structures and road closures and bus and train service delays and cancellations. There is expected to be dangerous driving conditions on the roads due to spray and flooding. There could be loss of power and other essential services, the Met Office says, including gas, water and mobile phone signal. Communities could be completely cut off, perhaps for several days, the weather warning states. Amber weather warning for wind and rain in Scotland. Storm Babette is expected to sweep strong winds across the northeast of Scotland with disruption likely from 10am to 6pm on Thursday the 19th of October. Exceptionally wet conditions, meanwhile, are expected across parts of eastern Scotland from 6am to 6pm today, that's the 19th of October. Injuries and danger to life is likely from large waves and beach material being hurled onto coastal roads and seafronts. People have been warned of flying debris which could lead to injuries or danger to life. Some roads and bridges are likely to close and longer journey times and cancellations are likely on road, rail, air and ferry services. Extensive flooding is possible and there is danger to life following fast flowing or deep flood water caused by the heavy rainfall. Yellow weather warning for rain in Scotland. Storm Babette is bringing a period of very heavy weather to many parts of Scotland from 6am on Thursday, 19th of October to 6am Saturday, October the 21st. Drivers are being warned of spray and flooding, leading to difficult driving conditions and some road closures. There is a chance of delays or cancellations to train and bus services and a small chance of fast flowing or deep flood water which could cut off communities by flooding roads. There is a small chance homes and businesses could be flooded, the Met Office said, and a slight chance of power cuts and loss of services. That article was written by Ginny Sanderson. This is from the Herald, Scotland, on Thursday the 19th of October 2023, from the News Section. Scotland Flights New Jet to Morocco Marrakesh Agadir routes. This exclusive article is written by Brian Donnelly. An airline and holiday business has added two new routes from a Scottish airport to Morocco to its schedule. Jet 2 has listed new twice weekly flights from Glasgow Airport to Marrakesh and Agadir, with both starting in November 2024. The Glasgow routes are two of ten introduced to UK airports and the only in Scotland. Other airports include Birmingham, Bristol, Leeds Bradford, London Stansted and Manchester. Leeds Bradford-based Jet 2 said of Marrakesh, 
wander the world-renowned Jamar El Finar Market Square, admire the cobalt blues and cactus greens at Yves St. Laurent's Jardin Margerelle, or unwind with a massage at a traditional hammam. It also urges travellers to take in the super skyline views from a rooftop cocktail bar and sample authentic Moroccan tagine dish. Flights start from Glasgow Airport to Agadir in 2024, flying on Sunday and Wednesday, and from Glasgow to Marrakesh on Monday and Friday. The double route win comes after Glasgow earlier secured Wizz Air flights to Budapest in Hungary and Bucharest in Romania. The Herald also earlier revealed that AGS Airport's Glasgow site reported a 214% surge to 6.5 million passengers last year against the year before. The group's adjusted revenues for the year were 92% higher at £167 million, while the previous year's operating loss of £25 million was reversed into an £11 million profit. After accounting for increased financing costs, the previous year's pre-tax loss of £67 million narrowed to £36 million. Directors, now led by Andy Cliff, who succeeded Derek Proven as chief executive of AGS at the start of this year, said they have worked to conserve cash in response to surging inflation and higher interest rates. Turkish Airlines, the world's largest airline by countries served, said Glasgow is among future new United Kingdom connections. That article was written by Brian Donnelly. This is from the Herald, Scotland, on Thursday the 19th of October, 2023, from the News section. The questions over NHS readiness for a Covid winter. This article is written by Helen McArdle. How is the NHS preparing for its fourth winter with Covid? The vaccine rollout has been accelerated but the UK's approach has been criticised as shambolic, amid concerns that excess stock is not being used in the 50 to 64 age group, while frail and elderly adults look likely to miss out on an updated JAG designed to maximise protection against new strains. Meanwhile, there has been a recent wave of surprise and confusion over the decision to quietly abandon COVID testing for symptomatic frontline staff. What's happening with vaccinations? Frontline healthcare workers in patient-facing roles with the NHS, care homes and in the community are being offered COVID boosters. As of October the 8th, roughly one month into the rollout, uptake was 17.4%. It is early days, many healthcare workers will still be waiting for their appointment but last winter coverage topped out at 57.7%, suggesting a mix of apathy and inconvenience. Some social care workers reported difficulties getting time away from work to get vaccinated. Over time, a combination of repeated boosters and repeated infections has understandably eroded people's fear of becoming seriously ill. The vaccines have also become gradually less protective against infection as the virus that causes COVID has mutated in ways that make it more transmissible and immune evasive. This has been seen again with the emergence of the BA286 Pirola offshoot of Omicron, described as the most immune evasive yet due to its ability to escape antibodies. This has prompted the UK government to stock up on Pfizer's newest mRNA COVID vaccine, tweaked to provide a stronger line of defence against infections caused by the XBB COVID strains, which have been dominant for most of this year. The UK is due to switch to this batch later in the rollout, and has bought up enough stock to include 50s to 64s in the rollout. Nonetheless, The Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, JCVI, the body that advises ministers, says there are no plans to extend eligibility to the end of 65s this winter. 
At the same time, the acceleration of the rollout in response to parola means that the higher risk groups, care home residents and over 75s, were reprioritized and vaccinated earlier than originally planned. As a result, most have been given the older Omicron B4 and B5 based COVID vaccines, which are likely to be less protective against infection from the currently circulating strains. How much that impacts the NHS remains to be seen. The primary goal of COVID vaccination is to reduce, as far as possible, the number of people dying or requiring hospital treatment as a result of the disease and, so far, the older vaccines are still expected to provide strong protection on that front. Testing Frontline NHS workers are still being taken by surprise by COVID testing changes, which were quietly introduced across the UK more than a month ago. The issue came under focus after Stephen Griffin, a professor of cancer virology, shared a memo on Twitter, X, from Shropshire Community NHS Trust, which went viral last week. In it, staff were told that in line with national guidance, symptomatic staff should not be testing for COVID-19, but simply staying home if they feel unwell. Underlining what many have interpreted to be the true impetus of this shift in guidance, minimising staff absence, the memo concluded, testing for COVID can result in having to remain at home for longer than their symptoms persist. This prompted an outpouring of anger among those who feel that already too little is being done to curtail the spread of COVID in healthcare settings. People soon began sharing similar memos from their own NHS trusts across England and Wales. There were some erroneous claims that such guidance had not been adopted in Scotland. In fact, as of August the 30th, symptomatic staff testing was also withdrawn here. This followed on from the removal of routine asymptomatic staff testing back in September 2022. As with the rest of the UK, some exceptions can be made for high-risk wards, oncology and dialysis, for example. But a circular distributed to NHS Scotland medical staff on September the 5th, forwarded onto the Herald by a consultant, makes clear that staff should not be testing for COVID-19. It adds, staff who attend work with respiratory symptoms should wear a mask throughout their shift and will be allocated to the red side to avoid immunocompromised patients for five days after the onset of symptoms. The same applies to staff who have undertaken an LFD, which has come back positive. Is that living with COVID or giving up on COVID? It depends who you ask. That article was written by Helen McArdle. This is from the Herald Scotland on Friday the 20th of October 2023. From the news section, Sir John Curtis. Tories face bigger defeat to Labour than in 1997. Report by Tom Gordon. Labour could be on course for a bigger landslide than under Tony Blair in 1997, Professor Sir John Curtis has said following the party's historic double by-election win. The Strathclyde University polling expert said the scale of the Tory losses to Labour in Tamworth and Mid-Bedfordshire overnight were exceptional. He told the BBC... When the last happened, the government did lose very badly indeed. The Conservative Party faces the serious prospect of losing the next general election heavily, and maybe even more heavily than they did in 1997. Former Tory Chancellor George Osborne had predicted that losing both seats would mean Armageddon is coming for the Tory party. Labour gained 146 seats in 1997 to win 418 MPs, giving Mr Blair a 179-seat majority, while Sir John Major's Tory party lost 178 seats and ended up with just 165 MPs. In Tamworth, the Tories had been defending a majority of 19,634 after former MP Chris Pincher quit the Commons 
in the wake of a sex scandal. He was found to have drunkenly groped two men in an egregious case of sexual misconduct at London's exclusive Carlton Club last year. Boris Johnson's mishandling of the situation helped bring about his own downfall. Labour's Sarah Edwards defeated Tory Andrew Cooper by 1,316 votes on a 23.9% swing. It was the second highest by-election swing to Labour ever recorded. Mr Cooper, a local councillor, walked out as Miss Edwards made her acceptance speech. By-election swings where seat has changed hands since 2019 general election. Hartlepool, May 6, 2021. 16 percentage points, Labour to Conservative. Chesham and Amersham, June 17, 2021. 25.2 percentage points, Conservative to Liberal Democrat. North Shropshire, December 16, 2021. 34.1 percentage points, Conservative to Liberal Democrat. Wakefield, June 23, 2022. 12.7 12.7 percentage points, Conservative to Labour. Tiverton and Honiton, June 23rd, 2022, 29.9 percentage points, Conservative to Liberal Democrat. Selby and Ainsty, July 20th, 2023, 23.7 percentage points, Conservative to Labour. Somerton and Frome, July 20th, 2023, 29 percentage points, Conservative to Liberal Democrat. Rutherglen and Hamilton West, October 5th, 2023, 20.4 percentage points, SNP to Labour. Mid Bedfordshire, October 19th, 2023, 20.5 percentage points, Conservative to Labour. Tamworth, October 19th, 2023, 23.9 percentage points, Conservative to Labour. Half an hour later, Labour overturned the largest majority since 1945 to win Mid-Bedfordshire, which the Tories had held since 1931. Nadine Dorries won the seat in 2019 with a 24,664 vote majority, but Labour's Alastair Strathern won by 1,192 votes on a 20.5% swing. Ms Dorries, a former Culture Secretary, quit after being denied a peerage in Boris Johnson's resignation honours and failing to speak in the Commons for more than a year. She had been accused by local voters of abandoning them while maintaining a lucrative broadcasting and publishing career outside Parliament. Visiting Mid-Bedfordshire, Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer said his party had made history with the double blow to Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. He said, We know that voters here have voted for us and they've put their trust and their confidence in a changed Labour Party and we will repay them for that trust and confidence. We do so humbly. I know there are people yesterday who probably voted Tory in the past who voted for a changed Labour Party because they despair at the state of their own party. He claimed Labour was redrawing the political map by taking seats which had been comfortably Conservative ahead of the general election expected next year. Mr Strathairn said his victory showed nowhere is off limits for this Labour Party. Well, Ms Edwards challenged Mr Sunak to get in your government car, drive to Buckingham Palace, do the decent thing and call a general election. Professor Sir John told the BBC No government has hitherto lost to the principal opposition party in a by-election a seat as safe as Tamworth. He added that the Tories may get caught in a pincer movement between some of their former Leave voters wandering off to Labour, but others going off to Reform UK. He added, It's reasonable to argue that the Conservative Party faces the serious prospect of losing the next general election heavily, and maybe even more heavily, than they did in 1997. He said many of the largest Tory vote collapses in previous by-elections had seen wins for the Liberal Democrats and didn't really presage very much. However, now Labour was the beneficiary. Mid-Bedfordshire and Tamworth had seen big falls in by-elections where the Conservatives are fighting their principal opponents, and that was unusual. Pressed about the possibility of Labour having a bigger win than in 1997, Professor Sir John repeated that it could happen, adding, we can't rule out that possibility. 
despite the particular circumstances of the by-elections, the low turnouts, and Sir Keir being less popular than Mr Blair in his heyday, he denied being overexcited. He said, What we're doing here is comparing by-elections with by-elections. The thing we are seeing in these by-elections last night are results and swings to the Labour Party. Together with that, in Selby three months ago, a Labour gain from then Tories on a 23.7% swing, commensurate with what happens in by-elections before the 1997 general election. That is the crucial takeaway. These are exceptional swings. They're exceptional swings to the opposition. And when they last happened, the government did lose very badly indeed. Mr Sunak was out of the country as the results came in, spending the night in Saudi Arabia on a tour of the Middle East in the aftermath of the Hamas attacks on Israel. And during the media rounds, Conservative Party Chairman Greg Hans sought to blame the legacy issues predating Mr Sunak's premiership, which led up to the two by-elections, suggesting people were happy with the job Rishi Sunak is doing as Prime Minister. He also pointed to low turnout in both votes, down from 74% at the 2019 general election to 44% in Mid Bedfordshire and from 64 to 36% in Tamworth. He told Times Radio, I don't see any enthusiasm for Labour, but clearly there's been a lot of, if you like, background circumstances in those two by-elections that have also made the job difficult for us. In Mid Bedfordshire, the Liberal Democrats came third and claimed their ability to switch Tory voters cleared the way for Labour's victory. Lib Dem Deputy Leader Daisy Cooper said, We nearly doubled our share of the vote, which would see the Lib Dems win dozens of seats off the Conservatives in a general election. The Liberal Democrats played a crucial role in defeating the Conservatives in Mid Bedfordshire, and we can play a crucial role in getting rid of this Conservative government at the next election. The Lib Dems came third in Mid Bedfordshire with 23.1%, compared to 34.1% for Labour and 31.1% for the Tories. However, the Lib Dems came sixth behind Reform UK, Britain first and UKIP in Tamworth, losing their deposit with 1.6% of the vote against 45.8% for Labour and 40.7% for the Tories. That report was by Tom Gordon. This is from the Herald Scotland on Friday the 20th of October 2023. From the news section. Storm Rebet. Met Office issues fresh red weather warning. Report by Craig Williams. The Met Office has issued another red weather warning in Scotland for Saturday, saying further very heavy rainfall could lead to more severe flooding and disruption. The forecaster said, Prolonged and very heavy rain is expected to develop across parts of Angus and Aberdeenshire area throughout Saturday, in areas already affected by severe flooding. Accumulations of 70 to 100 millimetres are expected over a period of 18 to 24 hours, the highest accumulations over the hills. Less rainfall is expected around coastal areas, but impacts from the higher rainfall further west will extend towards the coast. The warning covers all day on Saturday. First Minister Hamza Yusuf warned the further red warning issued by the Met Office would intensify the disruption caused by torrential rain from Storm Babette. Mr Yusuf posted on X, formerly Twitter, regarding the further red weather warning issued by at Met Office for Saturday. He told people this would intensify the disruption already being experienced. The Met Office tweeted, Red weather warning issued. Exceptionally heavy and persistent rain across eastern Scotland, Saturday, 0-100 hours to 23-59 hours. Latest info at https colon forward slash forward slash t dot co forward slash qwdlmfrbfs. Mr Yusuf said the Scottish Government would continue to liaise with local organisations and the emergency services. People's safety is our number one priority, he stressed. It comes as Storm Babette claimed its second victim in Scotland after police confirmed that a falling tree hit a van near Forfar on Thursday, killing the driver. Officers were called to a report of a one-vehicle crash on the B9127 at Wig Street, 
just after 5pm on Thursday. Emergency services also attended and the driver of the van, a 56-year-old man, was pronounced dead at the scene. Police said the man's next of kin have been informed. A report will be sent to the Procurator Fiscal. That report was by Craig Williams. This is from the Herald Scotland on Friday the 20th of October 2023. From the news section. Storm Babette. Power restored to 24,000 homes as 4,000 remain off supply. Report by Craig Williams. More than 27,000 homes in Scotland lost power due to Storm Babette, according to Scottish and Southern Electricity Networks, SSEN. The energy provider said as of 11.30am on Friday it had restored services to almost 24,000 homes and is working to reconnect 4,000 other properties which have been cut off. The main areas affected are Aberdeenshire, Angus and Perthshire, reflecting the Met Office's ongoing weather warnings for wind and rain and SEPA's flood warnings. SSEN said its field and support staff continue to do all they can in extremely challenging conditions to repair wind-related damage to its network. Andy Smith, SSEN Distribution Operations Director, said Storm Babette's severe effects continue to be felt, but our teams are making good progress. Through our automatic switching systems and the work of our teams on the ground, we have reconnected the majority of our customers who lost their supplies, and that effort continues today. We have ten times our usual operational capacity to respond to issues as they occur. Our teams are facing hugely challenging circumstances on the ground, and I'd like to thank customers for their patience. I want to reassure them we're doing everything we can to restore power as quickly as possible and to limit the number of prolonged outages. We encourage anyone who may need additional support to contact our dedicated teams on the 24-hour Power Cut helpline on 105. That report was by Craig Williams. This is from the Herald Scotland on Friday the 20th of October 2023. From the news section. Storm Babette. Red weather warnings continue in Scotland. Report by Gregor Kyle. Red weather warnings remain in place until midday in areas of Scotland on Friday, October the 20th, as Storm Babette threatens record rainfall, flooding and evacuations. Residents in the vicinity of Brecon River and South Esk were ordered to leave their homes yesterday afternoon, with local authorities setting up rest centres for those displaced by the storm. Around 400 homes were evacuated in the Brecon area, with the Met Office forecasting up to 250 millimetres rainfall in the area. This would shatter the most recent record of 62.1 millimetres in October 2020 and set a new record for rainfall in a single day in Scotland. Meteorologists also recorded 77 miles per hour winds in Aberdeen, where the Council opened rest centres at Stonehaven Community Centre and Mearns Campus at Lawrence Kirk in partnership with emergency services and community partners. People across the country are warned to stay away from coasts and shorelines while the red warning is in place, with the Met Office warning of exceptional rainfall, severe flooding and disruption. This is the first time since Storm Dennis in February 2020 that the Met Office has moved to issue a red warning for rain in Scotland, with emergency measures largely covering the east and northeast of the country. Residents have been warned of a danger to life and to avoid travel with widespread disruption, road closures and extensive flooding of homes and businesses anticipated. Met Office Chief Meteorologist Jason Kelly said, Eastern parts of Scotland will see exceptional amounts of rainfall and the significant accumulations are likely to cause considerable impacts from Storm Babette. Numerous amber and yellow rainfall warnings are in place for rainfall over the coming days, up to and including Saturday. But in the red warning area, 100 to 150 millimetres of rain is expected to fall quite widely, over 200 millimetres, which is expected to cause considerable impacts with flooding likely. Reinforcing the warning, Scotland's Deputy First Minister Shona Robison said, 
Red warnings are not often issued by the Met Office, so it's very important that people pay attention to those. People should check in with Police Scotland or Transport Scotland to make sure they know whether their area is covered. People should absolutely not travel in those areas. The services are doing their best to act as quickly as they can, she continued. Everybody is working very, very hard to make sure particularly those vulnerable people are supported to leave their homes. Those that are vulnerable will be put up in hotel accommodation. While services moved to evacuate locals in Brecon, one John Stewart, 82, told reporters that he would wait out the storm, building a wall around his garden to protect his home from flood damage. He said the wall had successfully stopped water from getting in from the street previously, where flooding was severe. He said, I won't be leaving because my wife won't go. The trouble is, the last time there was flooding, we couldn't get sandbags and ended up paying £3 each for them. The council is supposed to give you that stuff and they don't. Asked if he believes the council has a duty to supply such items to Brecon residents, he said they should look after the people in the area. The Scottish Environment Protection Agency, SEPA, also announced eight flood warnings for Mary Kirk, West Loose Bay North, West Loose Bay South, Logie Mill and Craigo, Canaird, Bridge of Dunn, Inchbare, Finavon and Tannadice and Churchill Barriers. SEPA also issued 12 flood alerts, covering regions ranging from Caithness and Sutherland in the north to Dumfries and Galloway in the borders. With heavy rain continuing throughout the night in the east and northeast of the country, the forecast remained very unsettled, with heavy rain and strong winds forecast throughout the day on Friday. Further heavy rain and winds are likely to continue on Saturday and Sunday, easing as the weekend progresses. The Met Office and Scottish Government will carry further updates while weather warnings are in place with people urged to check forecasts and warnings before travelling. We are only at the start of this weather event, warned Deputy First Minister Robison. That's really important for people to appreciate. There is the risk danger and possibility of more areas being affected, so we will make sure that any changes are communicated as quickly as possible. That report was by Gregor Kyle. From the Herald Scotland, Friday the 20th of October, from the sports section, Andy Robertson out for a while ahead of surgery, Klopp confirms. Article by Aidan Smith. Liverpool defender Andy Robertson is set for a long spell on the sidelines as he is to have surgery on a shoulder injury. The Scotland captain sustained the problem on international duty, but, having been assessed in his return to Merseyside, the club have decided an operation is the best solution. There is a little bit there, and I think the decision is we go towards surgery, said manager Jurgen Klopp. There is a little chance we could try, try without, but take, talking To pretty much all the experts, it looks like surgery will be the best thing, especially in the long term, definitely, and that means he is out for a while. I don't know exactly how long, but it is a shoulder surgery, so not exactly an easy one. In my experience, you can train pretty quickly again, but not football specific because you have to be careful of challenges and all these kinds of things, so he will be out for a while. And that report was by Aidan Smith. For the Herald Scotland, Friday the 20th of October, from the sports section. Brendan Rodgers issues Celtic injury update on Maida and Navrocki. Article by Aidan Smith. Celtic will have Dyson Maida in their squad for Sunday's Premiership clash against Hearts after he missed Japan's October friendlies, while centre-back Mike Navrocki could return after two months out with a hamstring injury. Manager Brendan Rodgers said, Dyson was okay. He had a slight knock after the Kilmarnock game and, with it being friendlies, the communication between their medical team and ours meant he didn't have to travel. He had some treatment for a few days, but he has been training now over a week, so he's absolutely fine. Mike is 10 days or so into his training and getting sharper every day and finding his football fitness. We will have a look at him. We are still to finalise the squad but the most important thing is that he is back training and available. Defender Stephen Welsh, 
and cool. And winger Lee Alabada, Vai, are Celtic's only absentees, heading into a busy period which will see them play seven times in 21 days. Roger said, Stephen is probably two weeks away from training with the team. He is out on the field working with the rehabilitation team and doing very, very well. Leal Abada is still a, bit, a little bit of time away. December he was earmarked to come back, so he's still on course for that. And that article was by Aidan Smith. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 23rd of October, Sports Section, Ex-Slavia Prague striker Abdallah Sima on why Rangers can beat Sparta. Article by Matthew Lindsay. Former Slavia Prague striker Abdallah Sima is expecting to get a hostile reception from fans of Czech champion Sparta this week, but he has expressed confidence Rangers can win the Europa League encounter and admitted he's eager to score against their opponents once again. Senegalese forward Sima spent a season at Slavia back in the 2020-21 campaign and netted 20 times in 39 appearances to help them complete a Czech First League and Czech Cup double. His impressive displays up front for the Fortuna Arena outfit resulted in him be- being named Czech Young Player of the Year and earned him a £7 million move to Premier League outfit Brighton. The 22-year-old, who has been on target for Rangers against PSV Eindhoven and Real Betis in Europe this term, is looking forward to the Group C meeting with Sparta in the Leitner Stadium on Thursday night greatly. Sima is keen to help Philip Clement's side bounce back from their embarrassing loss to Aris Limassol in Cyprus at the start of the month with a triumph that boosts their chances of progressing to the knockout rounds and he feels they are more than capable of doing so. Every European game is hard, especially when you play a team like Sparta Prague, he said. I know them well from my time in the Czech Republic and it will be a hard game for us. We have to concentrate on our team and what we can do well and not only focus on them. The quality we have here makes me think we can beat them over there. That's what I believe. But I understand it's a hard game for us. Sparta are the biggest team in the Czech Republic, so we are going to have to play at the level we showed against Hibs. But I am expecting us to win. Sima added, It is two years since I left Prague, but I have a lot of good memories of my time in that city. I was a Slavia Prague player, so, for sure, the Sparta fans will not like me. But I am happy to be going there in a Rangers shirt and we'll be doing everything to win this game. I don't think it will be a crazy game, but I do believe it will be very physical. We have physical players and they have physical players, so it's going to be like that. But I think we have more quality and, if we just focus on that and work together, we can win. I just played one game against them and I scored two goals, so I would love to do the same on Thursday. And that article was by Matthew Lindsay. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 23rd of October, from the sports section. Lewis Hamilton disqualified after finishing second in US Grand Prix. Article by Martin McMillan. Lewis Hamilton has been disqualified from second place in Sunday's United States Grand Prix for driving an illegal car. Nearly four hours after the chequered flag fell on Hamilton's most competitive race of the season, when he claimed he should have won if Mercedes did not fluff their strategy lines, the stewards declared his car's machinery did not comply with the regulations. The depth of the new floor in Hamilton's Mercedes was adjudged to be outside the thresholds outlined in Article 3.5.9e, which states the plant cannot be cannot wear to, be, to below 9mm thickness. Ferrari's Charles Leclerc, who finished sixth, was disqualified for the same breach following Sunday's 56th lap race at the Austin Circuit of the Americas. Hamilton's demise elevated Lando Norris to run her up behind Max Verstappen, who claimed the 50th win of his career and 15th from 18 this season, and Carlos Sainz to third. Sergio Perez was promoted to fourth to extend his lead over Hamilton in a fight for runner-up in the championship from 27 points to 39 with four races left. Mercedes Sporting Director Roy Meadows, Trackside Engineering Director Andrew Shoflin and Reliability Chief 
Richard Lane were summoned to fight ha- Hamilton's corner with the FIA's four stewards, which included former British driver Derek Warwick at 6pm local time, midnight British summer time. After 30 minutes, the trio emerged from the FIA offices in the paddock before Hamilton's punishment was handed down at 7.16pm local time, 1.16am PST. It is understood Mercedes will not appeal the FIA's verdict. A statement from the FIA read, During the hearing, the team acknowledged that the measurement performed by the FIA technical team was correct and stated that the high wear in the skid pads was probably a result of the unique combination of the bumpy track and the sprint race schedule on Saturday that minimised the time to set up and check the car before the race. The stewards note that the onus is on the competitor to ensure that the car is in compliance with the regulations at all times during an event. It continued, In this particular case, the rear skid in the area defined in the technical delegate's report was outside of the threshold outlined in Article 3.5.9e of the FIA Formula 1 technical regulations, which includes a tolerance for wear. Therefore, the standard penalty for a breach of the technical regulations is imposed. Four cars were chosen at random following the race. Both Verstappen's Red Bull and Norris McLaren passed the scrutineering checks. Addressing his punishment, Hamilton said, It is, of course, disappointing to be disqualified post-race, but that doesn't take away from it, from the progress. Mercedes boss Toto Will said, Setup choices on a sprint weekend are always a challenge with just one hour of free practice, and even more so at a bumpy circuit like COTA, and they're running a new package. In the end, all of that doesn't matter. Others got it right where we got it wrong and there's no wiggle room in the rules. We need to take it on the chin, do the learning and come back stronger next weekend in Mexico. Michael Schumacher was disqualified from the 1994 Belgian Grand Prix for an illegal floor, allowing Damon Hill to win the race. The post race penalties on Sunday night saw Williams Logan Sargent claim his maiden point in F1 the first American to score, score in the sport since Michael Andretti 30 years ago for McLaren at the Italian Grand Prix. And that article was by Martin McMillan. From the Herald Scotland, Friday the 20th of October, from the sports section. Philippe Clement on his plans to tear up Rangers training regime. Article by Eden Smith. Philippe Clement has revealed his plans to tear up the current Rangers training regime to implement a plan of his own. The 49-year-old became the 19th permanent manager of the Govan Club following the departure of Michael Beale at the start of the month. After playing at Genk and Club Bruges, Clement won the Belgian Pro League as manager with both teams, but he inherits a light blue side who are currently 7 points behind Premiership leaders and defending champions Celtic. Clement wants to now now wants to make his side the best in the country, and that blueprint will begin in the training field with changes set to take place from what was left by the outgoing Beal. He explained, There are a lot of things I want to improve in training. How we train, the length of training and more. There is a lot we can do, and hopefully helps reduce the injuries we have. We will train a lot collectively, but the players will have physical targets. It's about being brave, Playing forward, not thinking about being safe and not taking risks, not being worried about giving the ball away, not only playing at safe lateral passes. We are working on structure and the positions we want to see players in when attacking. I know how important the bond is between the supporters and the team, and it is important we rebuild this. I love the passion. I am a football addict. I love the atmosphere in the stadium. And that article was by Aidan Smith. The Herald on the 24th of October and the news section. Francis Street via Loch Gelly. Fire crews remain at scene by Jody Harrison. Fire crews battled through the night to contain a major blaze which broke out in a block of flats. Firefighters were called out last night after the alarm was raised in Francis Street in the town of Loch Gelly, Fife, around 7pm. Three appliances, including two high-reach devices, remained at the scene this morning. No casualties have been reported. Footage from the scene shows flame 
flames breaking through the roof of the four-story building and illuminating the night sky. At the height of the blaze, seven appliances were called to the site of the fire. The building was evacuated and a rescue centre set up at the nearby Loch Gelly Town Hall. A Scottish Fire and Rescue Service spokesperson said this morning, we were alerted at 7.05pm on Monday, October 23, to reports of a dwelling fire at Francis Street, Loch Gelly. Operations Control initially mobilised two appliances to the scene, and on arrival, firefighters increased to seven appliances and two specialist appliances. As of Tuesday, October 24, at 9.30am, our firefighters remain on scene working to extinguish the fire, affecting the roof of a flat on the top floor of a four-storey property. No casualties have been reported, and three fire appliances and specialist resources remain in attendance. People living nearby were warned to keep their windows and doors closed as the blaze raged on. A police Scotsman... Uh, as Police Scotland spokesman said last night, emergency services are in attendance at a building at fire at Francis Street, Loch Gelly. Officers are assisting with a number of road closures and diversions, diversions are in place. Please avoid the area if possible. Some residents have been evacuated and the rest centre has been set up at the Loch Gelly Town Hall and Bank Street for anyone affected. Local residents are urged to keep windows and doors closed due to smoke. Five council landed, fire in Loch Gelly, residents evacuated. Please follow police advice. And that was by Jody Harrison. The Herald on the 24th of December and the new section. New agreement between UK and devolved governments needed post-Brexit by Jody Harrison. The Scottish Parliament Committee has called for a new memorandum of understanding between UK government and devolved administrations following Brexit. A report from the Constitution, Europe, External Affairs and Culture Committee at Hollywood released on Tuesday said there had been a material change in how devolution looks following Brexit, with it being very different following the UK's departure from the EU. In 1999 and again in 2013, a memorandum of understanding... MOU was signed in between the administrators, laying out key parts of the devolution settlement not codified in law, which includes issues like internal international relations. Convener Claire Adamson said our recommendations for the new memorandum of understanding between the UK and devolved governments should be one of the first steps in the journey towards addressing the impact of the changes in devolution following our departure from the EU. As we navigate the path of regulatory divergence, it is critical that any new agreements acknowledge the fundamental principle that the Scottish Parliament must have the ability to effectively oversee all the powers within its competence. The evolving regulatory environment resembles a shifting landscape with its twists and turns, which has led to disagreements between devolved institutions and the UK government. These dynamics present challenges to the Scottish Parliament's core functions and its oversight of ministers that must be resolved to meet the challenges and opportunities ahead. The committee has also called for the creation of agreements on common frameworks and use of powers by UK ministers in devolved areas. Constitution Secretary Angus Robertson said, This report makes clear that Brexit has had a profoundly negative effect on the exercise of devolved powers and on the Scottish Parliament's important scrutiny role. Our own analysis, published in June, highlights examples such as the Internal Market Act and the Deposit Return Scheme, where UK government ministers have sought to increase their control over Scotland's devolved powers and impose legislation without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. We welcome the opportunity for further discussion on how devolution can better be protected, but a more respectful approach to the responsibilities of the Parliament is needed from the UK Government if the many legitimate concerns identified by the committee are to be addressed. And that was by Jodie Harrison. The Herald on the 24th of October and the news section. Destitution Scotland. ScotGov Welfare Benefits Keeping Rates Low by Julie Harrison Scotland has had by far the lowest rise in the number of people experiencing destitution across the UK, a new report's found. Research by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, JRF, found that there are an estimated 3.8 million people suffering from 
destitution UK-wide, including more than one million children. The study found that the UK has seen a shameful increase in destitution, although its increase in Scotland was markedly less than in other constituent parts of the country when they are broken down into regions. More generous welfare benefits brought in by the Scottish Government were said to be helping keeping levels of destitution in Scotland down. According to the report, rising levels of destitution mean almost two and a half times as many people are suffering as there were in 2017, with nearly three times as many youngsters affected. Rates of destitution, where people are not able to afford to meet their basic needs to stay warm, dry, clean and fed, are the highest in the London borough of Newham, it was, it's found. Glasgow City Council is ranked 26 in the 30 local authorities with the worst rates of destitution, but it had dropped 16 places from the previous report in 2019. The report found that at a regional level, London had the highest destitution levels in 2022, followed by the northeast and the northwest of England, and then the West Midlands. The regions in the south of England had the lowest rates of destitution, with both Wales and Scotland having rates comparable with the Midlands. While destitution had increased in all regions of the UK over the period 2019 to 2022, the report found Scotland's position had improved, with far, by far the lowest increase since 2019. It added this may be indicative of the growing divergence in welfare benefits policies in Scotland, notably the introduction of the Scottish Child Payment. The benefit, which was introduced in Scotland in 2021, gives £25 per child under 16 a week to eligible low-income families. The report, the fourth in a series by the JRF, with research done by Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, found overall there has been a shameful increase in the level of destitution in the UK. It highlighted the growing number of people struggling to afford to meet their most basic physical needs to stay warm, dry, clean and fed, insisting there is now an urgent need for action. Stating that the problem has been increasing at an alarming rate since 2017, the report added around 1.8 million households were destitute in the UK at some point over the course of 2022. Those households contained around 3.8 million people, of whom around a million were children. It's found that, as in previous studies, food was the most common essential that people were struggling with with destitution lacked in 2022. But with energy bills having risen uh, rapidly, heating was the second most common thing for people to struggle with, followed by clothes and toiletries. The report called on the UK government to introduce an essentials guarantee into universal credit payments, ensuring that the basic amount people receive can cover all basic needs, such as food, energy, toiletries and cleaning products. Doing this would have a significant impact on destitution, the report said. However, Chris Burt, the Associate Director for the JRF in Scotland, said governments at both Holyrood and Westminster need to step up to deal with the problem. He said the UK is a country with a dramatically increasing destitution, where millions of people can't afford heating or can't afford the basic essentials like clothes or food. In a country this wealthy, that is outrageous. But this needn't be the case. Destitution in Scotland is rising more slowly than in other parts of the UK, with the Scottish Child Payment and local welfare support offering some protection. Despite this, there is no cause for celebration when destitution numbers aren't falling. It is time for both governments to step up to this challenge that years of failed government policy have caused. This is particularly acute for the UK government and all the parties that are bidding to run it after the next election. We must come through for the Scottish people by embracing the essentials guarantee. The Scottish Government can also do more and will need to show it is willing to turn the tide on destitution in its forthcoming budget. Social Justice Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville said that this year and last year, the Scottish Government had allocated almost £3 billion to support policies to tackle poverty and to protect people as far as possible during the cost of living crisis, especially those who are most impacted. She added that as of the end of June, the Scottish Child Payment was providing 316,000 children with support worth £25 a week, with the Scottish Government also making £83.7 million available through discretionary housing payments to mitigate UK Government welfare cuts. 
Ms. Sonneville said, we'll estimate that 90,000 fewer children will live in relative and absolute poverty this year as a result of our policies, with poverty levels nine percentage points lower than they would have otherwise been. We continue to urge the UK government to introduce an essentials guarantee to ensure people can afford life essentials and ensure vulnerable people are properly supported. A UK government spokesman said the government's priorities are clear. The best way to help people in Scotland and across the UK with the cost of living is by driving down inflation and growing our economy. There are 1.7 million and a half fewer people in absolute poverty than in 2010, including 400,000 fewer children, but we know some families are struggling, which is why we're providing support with an average of £3,300 per household, including raising benefits by over 10% this year. To help people out of poverty through work, we are increasing the national living wage again and also investing £3.5 billion to help thousands into jobs by breaking down barriers to work. And that was by Jodie Harrison. From the Herald, Scotland, Tuesday the 24th of October, from the sports section, Atletico legend blames Celtic icon Jimmy Johnson for 1974 shame game. Report by Mark Walker. Atletico Madrid legend and captain in their 1974 shame game against Celtic, Andilardo Rodriguez, incredibly blamed Hoops icon Jimmy Johnson for the infamous mayhem that night. And he labelled the late Celtic great actor and accused him of hiding in the second leg in Spain. Celtic face Atletico tonight in the Champions League, but the La Liga giants have dragged up painful memories of one of the most notorious games ever to take place, by insisting on wearing the exact same replica strip of the one they wore on April the 10th, 49 years ago in the first leg of the European Cup semi-final. Turkish ref Dogan Babakan ended up sending off three players from Atletico, who conceded a total of 51 free kicks that night, and Johnson, voted the greatest ever Celt in a fan's vote in 2002, took the brunt of it. However, Rodriguez who is now 84 and won three Spanish titles in 553 appearances, put the blame squarely on Johnson, who passed away 17 years ago. He said, Jimmy Johnson was the one who caused it all up. He was a very skillful player, very quick, good. Of course he was fouled, that's normal. What happened is that he got multiplied it tenfold with his gestures by pretending, and that's why he got in our nerves and got the crowd going. He was a great actor. The ref sent off three players and I had to mark him and I had a hard time with him. I called him everything in Spanish and with some ugly words in English that I knew. I think he understood me from the look in his face. When I finished I told him I'll wait for you in Madrid. The police and his coaches surrounded him so that no one would mess with him. They didn't let me go any further. In the second leg, he didn't even dare to move. He didn't look like a winger, he looked like a linesman because he was so far away from us. He didn't want to know anything. And Rodriguez insisted it was actually Atletico who were treated badly at that infamous night and not Celtic. He pointed out, Celtic were very confident that they would qualify, that's why they were so angry. They were unable to beat us with 8 players for more than 25 minutes. You had to be there to see what we had to endure. The Scots created this climate for a battle. The press, the fans, before we even got there, they said that Ruben Ayala and Ruben Diaz were butchers. For us, it was like the European Cup final itself and we gave everything. It was like a war. In the airport on the way home, they threw our passports to the ground. The police beat us after the game. It seemed like an attack by an army. Actually, we were not a violent team. We went to Belgrade and won 2-0 and were applauded off the pitch. The thing about violence was an invention of the Scottish press. And that article was by Mark Walker. From the Herald Scotland, Tuesday the 24th of October, from the sports section, Rugby World Cup to be expanded to 24 teams in 2027. Article by Martin McMillan 
The next World Cup will be expanded to 24 teams as part of a new global calendar approved by World Rugby's Council. The change that will come into effect for Australia 2027 is intended to provide more qualification opportunities for emerging nations as well as regional competitions. Further details of the arrive for of the revised format for the group stage will be announced at a World Rugby press conference on Tuesday afternoon. A new biannual international competition is also to be launched in 2026, comprising of two divisions of 12 teams with promotion and relegation, commencing from 2030. The matches will take place in the July and November international windows. And that article was by Martin McMillan. The Herald on the 24th of October and the Arts and Ends section. St. Giles' Cathedral, music commissioned to be performed for the first time by Craig Williams. A new choral work, which has been commissioned as part of St. Giles' Cathedral's 900th anniversary, is being performed for the very first time during a public concert this weekend. Helen Grimes' new Missa Brevis premieres at the iconic building, which is thought to have been founded by King David I in 1124 in the run-up to celebrations next year. Meaning short mass, the Missa Brevis is the fourth of five new works that have been released annually since 2020 and lasts about 15 minutes, making it the longest. The compositions collectively form a choir book, a format that is keeping with the hundreds of years of sacred music associated with the historic Edinburgh Church. Michael Harris, who is Master of the Music at St Giles, explains why he had the idea for the project. A choir book has various connotations because it can be just be a collection of pieces or part books for singers. There are some famous medieval and reconnaissance examples, but there was also one for the Diamond Jubilee of the Queen, which was done nationally. I've always been quite keen on expanding the repertoire of music composed by Scottish composers for the church, so this seemed a good thing to do for such a momentous occasion as the 900th anniversary of the founding of St Giles. Due to the Scottish Reformation in 1560, When the Church of Scotland moved away from accompanied singing during services until the 19th century, Mr. Harris is only the fourth person in his role, with only few records surviving of the music from when Sir Giles was a Catholic place of worship. The Herald's on the 24th of October and the Arts and Ends section. Why Elon Musk's X marks a spot of danger by Theo Sanidis. When Elon Musk stepped through the doors of Twitter headquarters around a year ago, he did so with bluster, promising to bring an end to fake accounts, to bring back high-profile users who had been banned, and to create what he viewed as a haven for free speech. He looked to achieve this and to make the company more financially sustainable through swathes of job cuts and controversial changes to the platform, including the ability to buy a blue tick, previously the platform's method of marking a high-profile account as genuine. Twitter, or X as it's now known, would trundle on, seemingly unaffected, seemingly being the operative word. You can remove the handlebars and the brakes from a bike and keep pedalling. It'll be fine at first, but eventually you run into trouble. A year later, it's more apparent than ever what the trouble is. Against the backdrop of global crisis, misinformation, falsehoods, and disturbing content, it is running rife. Cuts to units handling con- content moderation and misinformation means what will appear in a user's feed can be unpredictable. Clicking on a seemingly innocent hashtag related to the new series of Big Brother can also unearth disturbing images from a war zone, and looking for the latest on a global news event is a risky activity. The decision op- to open up the blue checkmark system to anyone has made it challenging to differentiate a legitimate journalist or news outlet from someone posing as one. And this has allowed fake news stories to go viral on a regular basis. Recently, an account posing as a reputable news source falsely claimed that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had been taken to hospital. This gained a level of traction online before the account was suspended. Concerningly, this is influencing real-world events, distorting reality and making it difficult for users to identify what is actually going on in the interest of breaking news. 
Twitter used to be a powerful tool, documenting events in real time and allowing people to stay safe in the event of an emergency. It is still possible to follow a news event in real time, of course, but it is more challenging to determine the fact from fiction, and whether footage being shared is indeed from the news event in question. Whether or not this will be allowed to continue is another thing. The European Union's Digital Services Act, DSA, compels X and other platforms to follow new rules on fake news and harmful material. Musk, so far, seems unwilling to comply, leaving him facing a critical decision to exit the EU market or face potentially crippling sanctions. While financially driven, this action would also serve as a litmus test for the platform's reliability and dependability, and may set the tone for regulatory responses across the Western world. A bad decision from Musk's perspective risks reducing advertising revenue and pushing content producers and influencers to a rival platform. Possessing the money to purchase a platform does not imply ownership of its many stakeholders. In this context, Meta Threads and Blue Sky emerge as strong competitors with Meta, in particular, displaying a willingness to negotiate and adapt to the developing digital regulatory environment, a posture that Mark Zuckerberg has consistently advocated for in recent years. This may be where Musk erred, underestimating the complexities and volatility of the social media economic model. This may encourage Musk to take action, even if, as a self-proclaimed free speech absolutist, he would rather not. As determined as he may be, have been to turn Twitter into his version of what it should be, he presumably won't want to be left owning the world's most expensive ghost town. Either way, there will still almost certainly be change in the horizon. The challenges faced by X are not going away. Whatever happens next, lessons are being learned. Whether it's Musk or his competitors who benefit from this remains to be seen. And that was by Theo Sin- San Idis. That concludes this week's edition of the Herald Scotland podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels at Tune Review. Tell your friends about our service. 